All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first lecture behind the scenes with the conductor series featuring Dr. Richardson. Uh, my name is Molly Sweet. So um, I have the pleasure of actually being a member of the orchestra. I'm in the clarinet section. And I also serve as the musician liaison. So I get to interact with a lot of our musician members um, pretty frequently. So just a few housekeeping items before we start today. I'm actually going to mute everybody and turn your videos off just so that we have a, a clean canvas for Dr. Richardson's um, presentation. But uh, throughout, if we have, if you have any questions, we're going to do a Q&A at the end. So feel free to send a message to me via chat. So you can do that and I will moderate the questions when we get there. Um, all right, so well, that's everything for me. So I'd like to turn it over to our president and founder of the orchestra, Nadine Turk. Hi, thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for the Civic Orchestra of Jacksonville's very first online lecture series. We began today with a conversation with our esteemed conductor, Dr. Marguerite Richardson, on the art and practice of conducting an orchestra. Even for musicians, it's rare and a real treat to get to have a candid conversation with a conductor. So, Marguerite, are you ready? <laughs> conducting mm -hmm. looks so easy, and I've heard multiple people say, oh, I could do that. Like, your baton is a magic wand, and all you have to do is wave it around, and suddenly the musicians start to play. But what exactly is it you do um, when you're conducting an orchestra? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Nadine. Uh, I would say that, yes, a lot of times we, we think of that baton as sort of a magic wand. And I know that when we all get back together um, to play again, it's absolutely going to feel like magic. I have no doubt of that. Um, but it it is many things, the, the baton and conducting, um, multifaceted is how I can describe it. I actually used to teach uh, conducting, beginning conducting to students from a uh, very old, actually very old textbook. And I'll actually show, recommend it <laughs> at the end. Um, but the, the, toward the end, when they were summing things up after going through all the mechanics, the author said 95% of conducting has nothing to do with conducting. And that's actually kind of true. Um, when you're a conductor with, you know, any group, there are certain things that the conductor is going to have to address. And sometimes it's whether or not all the instruments are matching pitch, intonation. Sometimes it's just making sure all the little finely cut puzzle pieces fit together and that would be our ensemble. Um, sometimes it's working out a very, very challenging part for one or two instruments, maybe very intricate. Uh, so those, those are sort of the things that the baton uh, sort of leads the magic on from the conductor. And the, those items don't really change from one group to another. They may, their emphasis may change and their, um, how much you have to, how much time you maybe have to spend on one of those. Uh, professionals, you may spend less time on, uh, say, getting it in tune, uh, whereas a beginner group, you're going to spend much more time helping, helping you know, young players learn listening skills. Um, so, so those same things, I, I like to think of it as a, a pie chart, and it's a pie chart with a whole lot of pieces, and how, how those pieces, how the size of those pieces changes, uh, sort of depending on the group, but the actual things in the pie don't change. So again, it's, it's going to be, um, the, uh, the job of the conductor is to analyze what they're, you know, the people with whom they're working, and then to decide um, which, high piece they want to work on. Uh, it's a, that's a little simplistic idea of it because of course, you know, we don't just meet once and then do a concert. Uh, typically, even professional orchestras don't do that. 
So um, part of that then, the, the magic wand, is um, putting a lot of pieces together uh, that any conductor does and making sure that you've sort of matched your, your take on that pie to the group you're working with. Um, that, and that, like I say, that goes through any, any group that you're working with, whether it's also instrumental or choir, band, orchestra, that, that part of the conducting pie, which is sort of how being taught conducting or learning to conduct, um, you know, you hear a lot about choral conducting versus instrumental conducting or band conducting, that they're all very different. But, but when you come down to it, all conducting is conducting. Now, choral conducting does have some very specific things um, that gesture-wise and things that they focus on, maybe more phrasing, more text placement than in instrumental. We tend to be a little more about rhythmic placement, uh, specifically within a uh, visual framework. But sort of the common denominator on all of this is the conductor is joining all those those items that have to be addressed in a rehearsal or in a concert all together at one time. So it's it's like a clearing house for everything that's going on. Um, so I hope that, that that kind of answered your your question, Nadine, about the magic. <laughs> <laughs> a lot goes into it. Yeah. Can you um, can you take us through the process of picking out a program for a concert? How do you do that with the yeah. different groups you're you're involved with? Well, and that's that's actually an excellent excellent question because like everything, you know, there's no um, there's no outline that's like one size fits all in music, and that is sort of the the part of music that's so wonderful actually. So. If you're, if you're looking for, say, an academic group, because I do conduct an academic orchestra, you know, I have to look at, eh, when was the last time we maybe did a Beethoven symphony? Or when was the last time we've done a certain kind of piece? Um, when I work with civic orchestra, I have fewer programs to work with, so I have to really make sure I'm, I'm looking at a lot of things. So, one of the things you're going to be looking at is, you know, your, your orchestra. Who, what players do we have? What, what pieces and what style periods can we cover and not leave people out? You know, we, we want to try to have everyone who wants to play to play. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, you also have to think about, you know, wow, there's so much type. There's so many types of music. There's so much out there. Everything from, you know, the, the, the classics to unknown classics, you know, things that maybe should be classics but aren't. Um, everything through, um, you know, do we want just absolute music, music which is beautiful just for the sake of its, its being played, or are we looking to match up a theme? You know, we had a recent concert uh, talking about exploration, and we explored space and we explored the ocean. So that music sort of was all chosen to fit that theme. And that's the great thing about music is because there's music for just about anything we can think of. Sometimes we want to have a, a message. You know, is the music really saying something um, socially? Is it commenting? And a lot of times we think those pieces would be more contemporary. And yet we can go back, we can look at the great, you know, Aaron Copeland's A Lincoln Portrait that really, you know, that's a early 20th century, mid 20th century work, and yet it's very powerful. The music's powerful, the text is powerful, it's music with a message. And um, even our God Created Great Whales that we recently did was focusing on a message at the time it was written of the whale populations being, um, you know, depleted in the ocean. So, you know, we, we want to look at that. Are we trying to say something, you know, to our audience through this, this program? Um, and then you want to make sure as you're picking the, the program itself that you think about the pace. Usually, you know, you don't want to sort of ease into a concert. You want to start with something very splashy and get people's ears, get their attention. And then maybe you can go to a more serious, a deeper work, more introspective. But then you want to have a balance, light, you know, light music or maybe build up sort of a, a, 
a growing sensation from the beginning to the end of the program. So you, you actually have to think about that, you know, your, your impact on your audience and the players. You know, the players get, get tired <laughs> after sitting there, so you have to kind of balance all that. Um, you have to, you want to cover different styles of music. Like I said, we do some lighter pieces, like uh, we've done some dances from Fiddler on the Roof, and we've done um, everything to the water music by Handel. So, you know, we're looking at a wide range of moods. Um, since our group is made up of a wide, wide range of players, our civic orchestra, uh, from people who majored in music to maybe people who just love it, um, I'm always looking for that golden mean, like that one perfect piece that's so challenging for everyone, but not discouraging for anyone. So you want to, you know, stretch your abilities, stretch my abilities, stretch the abilities of the, the members of the orchestra, stretch our audience even, get them to really have to listen maybe some a little bit more carefully. I was afraid that the, the chaos that we represented in Great Well, if anyone's here that hasn't listened to it, I believe it's up on our Facebook, um, I was afraid some of that, art, the, the aural sensations were going to be kind of like, ooh, too out there for the audience, but boy, they, they really, you know, got into it. Um, and I'd say sort of the last part of the process of picking it is, is it enjoyable for the audience? Are they going to like listening to it? Really important part of this, does the, or do the orchestra members themselves get like a personal satisfaction out of playing it? Um, that's very important to me because I've played an orchestra since I was six and still consider myself an orchestral player as much as a conductor. So for me, just that there is definitely a, a, a inner feeling you have when you've contributed to such an important um, piece of, of music as a Beethoven symphony. Um, but at the same time, there's nothing quite like having the fun of uh, playing something like a John Williams ET um, extraterrestrials on Earth. So um, you, my thing is always for the players themselves to have that feeling inside that they've really done something so important. And it's you know the sum, the great, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Everyone's contributing his or her part, but that whole is just you know so so big. Um, I know this one. This one's a little bit of an involved question. So I, I may just sort of, you know, move sort of the next ideas, you know, after the picking the program to me is usually the hardest part. Then we have to go into the rehearsal process and rehearsals are, um, again, everything is pacing. You know, we're dealing with humans at every level in an orchestra. So to me, it's good to start out playing the whole piece, um, kind of see where everybody is. And then we start doing the breaking down, that sort of analysis and synthesis, taking things apart, seeing, again, like I said, the, where the pieces fit together. Um, and then, then we start putting things back together. We usually have four to five rehearsals. So we have sort of sometimes more playing rehearsals, play through rehearsals, more, you know, detail work rehearsals, and kind of getting that all, um, all that, you know, to see how it works out with people. You know, it's that you have a theoretical idea in your mind, well, this is hard, and that's going to be needing a lot of rehearsal, and, but this is very easy, I don't have to worry about that, and a lot of times those things can be 100% backwards uh, when you get with the actual, in the field, you know, you, something you thought would be so easy becomes a, a tricky, a tricky point, and then something that everybody looked at and was terrified of and practiced really, really hard, like, goes the first time. So you're like, okay, well, that's, that's taken care of. So, um, and that is sort of the other side of this is everyone is dependent on everyone else in the ensemble, which is a, a sort of daunting, but it's, um, but it's good because then we sort of uh, support each other um, by how prepared we are. And although, um, back to your magic wand, you know, the, the, the wand never makes a sound theoretically, unless you hit something. But the wand's not supposed to make any sound, the baton. Um, so you would think, well, we don't really have to practice like the principal oboe or the violins or the timpanist. Uh, but that's not true. Um, I spend actually a good bit of time um, studying like visually the music. Sometimes I do listen. I was trained in Suzuki methods, so I'm a sort of an aural learner. But uh, 
we have to study it and we have to, again, anticipate what kind of, you know, gesture is going to work here for this music. And here's a place where it slows down and then speeds up. How am I going to do that? Um, at the beginning of that first reading rehearsal and or online, as we've done this summer, um, I will say that this gesture will be in one place or another place. And we have talked about um, as a group, the orchestra as a group on, on knowing what I'm going to do. So it's not a surprise. Nobody wants a surprise in an orchestra. So as much as I'm able to, I give them information ahead of time on what they can anticipate from me. And then we work through it. So um, for like making a program, there is the, the side, deciding on the music part, and then there's the actual doing the music part. Um, and then that eventually leads to a really great concert. So um, does that, I hope that kind of covers that. Yes, and that, that does. And it leads me to my next question, which is, you know, as much as the musicians practice and, and have rehearsal with you, a concert is still a live performance <laughs> and things can go wrong. What happens, what do you do if the musicians are off, some of them are not on the beat with you, or what if you lose your place? What if there's a, a misstep during a concert? What, what can you do? Um, first, I will be honest and say that those missteps can happen on the podium, and sometimes those missteps do happen out in the orchestra. So part of rehearsing is so that we do have that aural uh, joint concept of what, what it is when it's correct. And sort of the, the first rule at, in conducting is that the moment that you feel that something has, has gotten apart, that there's a pulling in too much, we'll just say individuality in the, in the players, uh, the first rule is go small. So you want to take your gestures very small, very precise, and like what we would call like a tiny box. Uh, if you think of a, um, in baseball, the batter's box, conductor sort of has a box in front of him or herself. And that is sort of where your gestures lie. And the first rule is to like zero it in. So you think of it as like focusing when you like focus on your device, you focus on your tablet or your phone. So you zero it in. And by doing that, that tends to get people's attention. Um, and that generally will help. Now, I've worked with everything from very young orchestra players, like age nine and up, through high school, through college, through professionals, through, you know, the whole gamut. And I will say this is, I, there have been missteps in every group with which I've ever worked or played. It does happen. Uh, I mentioned the other day when we were talking about conducting uh, I have a very vivid memory uh, when I was at the Cleveland Institute of Music, which is a very well-known conservatory. Uh, I won't say the conductor's name, but we were in the middle of something and the piece ended and man, our conductor just kept on going. And finally he's like, oops, okay, we're done. <laughs> so sometimes it happens. I think everybody has a couple of, you know, horror stories or maybe they're good stories. They usually are funny stories um, of what happens if the conductor gets off. Um, conducting, I will say, you see a lot of conductors, especially, you know, the Dudamels or Joan Flettas or, you know, whoever out there conducting from memory. And I tend to not do that, even if I have essentially memorized the score, uh, only because if there is a misstep and I need to call out, you know, a letter or, you know, sometimes you can do it with, you know, letter A, <laughs> letter C, um, if it's really gotten derailed. Uh, you can usually get a group back on, uh, but I do like to have the, in, in my panic or worry, if something were to get off, I don't want to go like, hey, what's that letter D or C? So I tend to use a score uh, for myself. Um, I do a lot of contemporary music, and I have to memorize, especially anything which has complicated meters, uh, which is the time. So if the time is going, the pulse is going from very nice and regular to irregular, um, those are the ones that keep me awake at night and stress because if you give that wrong pulse to the, to the, uh, orchestra, you've really given them the curveball. So I do try to memorize those and sort of, you know, top secret, um, since I still, 
you know, perform as a violinist, uh, sometimes I'll play some of the parts so that I can really internalize those beats. And that will help me, um, again, be very internalized on, on the music, on the changing meter, the changing time calls. Um, you know, sometimes we have to look at um, if one player gets off versus a whole group of players. Uh, if one player gets off, generally, um, you know, there's like a joke in, uh, in orchestras about, you know, don't play louder. <laughs> If if you're off, it's not the first thing to do is not mm, I'm la I'll play loud and because I'm right. Um, the first rule is actually play as softly as you can, because you want to start listening and then trusting that aural memory, that sound memory of rehearsals, and that generally will get get people back on. But it does absolutely 100% happen that things can get off. Uh, but like I say, hopefully, usually they end up being more a good, amusing story to tell your friends after the class. <laughs> we all have one. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, how, how does a conductor bring out the best in the conductor's mm -hmm. musicians? What, what are some strategies for that? Um, that's, that's really a good question. And I think that is sort of the um, the quest for for most conductors because when you get back to that that sort of that basic question of what does the conductor do what does the conductor do uh, you know you could put a metronome on a stand or you know these days you could quickly and and I've done this with when you play with movies you know they put a little uh, earplug or earphone in your ear where you're listening to just a beat clicking and that's how you know the group stays together there's a conductor but but everybody's playing to the the, the sound of the, the metronome in their ear so if we can do that to play with a movie or to play with some other very time sensitive show why don't you just do a Beethoven symphony that way um, because the, the conductor has that intangible little part and that is the conductor has to have that vision of the piece and sometimes we think well that would be with you know the great masters you know you don't need a vision of um you know again et or something but you do because when you're on the podium you've got anywhere from 40 to 80 people in front of you they all play their instruments they all have a sense of what the music is supposed to be for them and you've got a trumpet player who's like my line is the best line in here and you've got a cello player who's like this is this is the mess this is the best tune in it and i'm going to play it loud says piano so it plays to play it softly no nah, mm -mm, it's great i'm going to play it so you've got all these different ideas of the music and the one thing the conductor has to do is coalesce all those ideas, take, take that energy from all the different ideas, and then morph that into one vision. And that vision tends to be the conductor's vision. I'm not saying conductors do not take feedback, because conducting is it's a very circular situation. You're always feeding off the, what you're getting from the musicians in the orchestra, and sort of refining it and then giving it back. Um, but you have to have, if you're the conductor, you've got to have an idea of where you want it to go, sort of the architecture. Where's the biggest moment in the music? How are we going to um, interpret this, this marking that the composer put in who may or may not be living? We may be able to go to a living composer and say exactly what did you mean here? That's always, that's like great. Um, sometimes we have to um, really think about the what's you know we're sort of speaking it's a live art you know it, every time a piece is played it's a it's a new living version of it so you know we what are we bringing to the table what is my interpretation bringing to the table um, yes I would I would agree I'm seeing that there can be even more interpretations with the living composer. Um, and the beauty of working with composers is those visions change and adapt and with each performance maybe change. So it's, it's such a, 
uh, living, breathing, um, adaptive art form. And that's one of the reasons I think music is so successful um, because it does adapt to, to, you know, life and to who's living it and who's creating it. What are the circumstances? So for me as a conductor, it's to formulate that from the music, take all these, these inputs and really come up with something that's going to be the personality of the group I'm working with and really speak to them, you know, with the, the voice of the members, but sort of filtered through my personal um, interpretation, my personal take on it. I might want to stretch one moment just forever until I get, you know, goosebumps or something. And that's, that's the prerogative, I guess, of being a conductor. And I think that's why so many people want to do it. Because as much as it is, it's wonderful to perform and it's wonderful to play and get your voice out there, there is something incredibly special about sitting in an orchestra all these billion, billions of years and then being able to say, you know, I really, I really would like to have done it this way every time I've played it. And now when I'm conducting, I, I get to do that. So I guess it's a little selfish, but it's also, it's also really wonderful. Um, you do have to get your musicians to to buy in or to believe in your vision and to join you into believing. I mean, one, one of my most wonderful memories of my symphonic playing was a Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. And we had a wonderful conductor and his vision of Tchaikovsky V was a little different. It was very um, flexible, incredibly flexible, uh, which is to mean it wasn't quite as, you know, pulse forward. <laughs> Um, and when I go back, I think of that. It was one of the most amazing experiences musically, uh, but it was not something I would have personally done, but it totally worked because he was so committed to it that you gave all your musical energy over to him and his vision. So that to me, that, that's, that's sort of the how you bring out your best is that you let them know you're feeding off their energy. And I think anybody who's played in an orchestra knows that the audience to orchestra musicians, that there is an energy in the room. And that's why I know live music is, can come back strong because that energy is tangible. So I hope that kind of addresses you. that for you. That was wonderful. It was, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I know there's probably a lot of people that have questions for you. So I know Molly is, um, she has access to these questions and I think she's going to send some your way. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Oh, certainly. Yes, thank you, Marguerite. And we do have a few questions from our viewers. Uh, so we'll start. Um, let's see, we've got one. Um, I'm watching with my 11 year old daughter who's currently learning to play violin. From the conductor's perspective, what advice would you give to an aspiring violinist who has not yet played with an orchestra and has fears of playing in front of people? Ooh, um, oh, that's a good one. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the first, uh, sort of the, the first thing I would do, um, especially this is, you know, for the, for the mom, I mean, you're going to have to make that performing experience um, something that's a safe and positive, right? We don't want anybody crying and running off stage. So um, what I would say is create a practicing of performing. And to do that, you know, that means, you know, it's 11 years old, I'd say maybe set up your favorite play things and make, a, make an audience you're comfortable with and perform for them, little bits at a time, little baby steps. Um, I remember as a kid, you know, any big family holiday, it was like, oh, don't you want to play something for your grandfather? So of course I wanted to play something for my grandfather. Uh, but but those those sorts of baby steps, like finding finding those people that you're comfortable in front of, um, playing, you know, a little bit alone. I think I think orchestras, especially youth orchestras, you know, the, the orchestras that that are for the age group. And we're so good at, at helping 
the, the players, the young players, really develop that confidence and um, sort of their, their uh, the positive feelings that come from working with their, their peers. And I guess that's the beautiful thing about youth orchestras and, and starting to play with other musicians when you're young is that you definitely have a sense of supporting each other. It's a very collegial and, and supportive environment. Um, you know, I think there, we all know that there's a lot of people that kind of, you know, seem to have no fear. And yeah, that was always sort of our joke when I was in school about, you know, everybody is Joshua Bell in the practice room. Well, everybody is, you know, on Sophie Mooder in the practice room. The hard thing is, you know, who, who are the people that when they walk out the practice room have such an incredible self-confidence in what they're saying that they can play the same way? I mean, we all, you know, I used to say it, my students say it to me, it was perfect at home. Uh, I think we've all, you know, we've all been there. Anybody who's studied a musical instrument, you go to your lesson, it's like, uh, which, you know, which one, which one do these tune with? Um, so I would say, especially for 11 years old, you know, that's, that's a really great time to um, get into a, a orchestra for that age group, um, either at school or through community groups or, you know, various uh, venues and most cities have a have a youth orchestra of some kind so I would say the first thing is just to to practice playing for people that you trust and then you know baby steps and I think the other thing about stage fright if you want to talk about it is is talking about it acknowledge it and you know so often before my students recitals you know they're nervous and I don't even want to say to them oh my gosh I'm so nervous for you because I've been there, I've been literally in their shoes, and I think sometimes it's it is important to just say, you know, look, you're gonna be you're gonna be a little nervous. Here's some strategies, you know, make sure you sleep really well, do self talk about you know the music better than anyone else because you do. You have to trust your practicing, um, and you know, one thing I always tell my students, and I think this is for any age student, you know, that what you want people to walk away from and say is not that was the hardest piece I've ever heard you play. But you want to have them walk away and say, wow, you know, that was really beautiful. Or there was a really, you know, there was great music happening there. Um, and so, especially at uh, age 11, you know, it's tough. Any instrument's tough. Violin's tough. I know, I was there. Um, but just to acknowledge that, you know, it's, we're not going for perfection. We're going for communication. And I think if, if a young student can kind of remember that and, you know, saying what they want to say, that that's, that's really, that's what's important when we get out there and perform, whether it's solo or, or with a group, that we really are communicating to our listeners. So does that, um, I hope that helps. <laughs> oh yeah, wonderful. I, I love that. We're not going for perfection, but communication, I think that's really important to remember. Um, so just everyone, just if you do have a question, feel free to send it in the chat. We're getting a few that way, but I didn't know if anybody who came on late missed that. So if you have a question, you can type it to me in the chat. All right, our next question. Not all conductors use a baton. Have you mm -hmm. conducted without one? And what are your thoughts on the use of one? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, very good question. Um, the baton, uh, sort of from the, the practical standpoint, you know, his, historically, the, I think the story is that um, uh, someone took a, like a piece of paper uh, and rolled it, that that's sort of where the, the baton comes from. Then you have sort of the idea of um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully, who was a famous conductor who had a big, like a, uh, more of a staff. Than what we call a baton. It wasn't handheld. It well, it was handheld, but it was like in as tall as he was, and he was pound it into the ground, and that kept the beat. Um, and he actually pounded it through his foot, and he kind of died from that. But um, so may, maybe that's why now they're very small. They can do a lot less damage. Um, so probably the truth is, you know, again, somewhere in there. Um, there, the schools of thought generally are that baton 
the end of the baton is for more rhythmic music and we use our more you know freer hand a uh, baton free hand gestures for more lyrical music um, I'm a little more practical than that to me the baton is less about that as it is peripheral vision and I say that because the old the, the orchestra adage is you know one eye on the music one eye on the conductor clearly that is um, sort of a metaphoric thing because they don't really expect you to, to do that however you do have to train yourself in orchestra to see motion and because you can't always take your eyes off the music that's just a fact so the the baton to me is because it's an extension of your hand definitely helps people that are on the periphery of a of an orchestra or a band or even a choir um, to see the motion of the conductor because you see the the motion the movement you know your eyes see motion before they see color so you actually are seeing the motion and that helps with ensemble um, i personally uh have a belief that you can be just as lyrical and legato really smooth uh with a baton and um my personal belief is i teach with a baton i use a baton i don't necessarily i don't go back and forth i know a lot of conductors that will do you know a very rhythmic music and then very ceremonially put it down and then conduct the slow or a lyrical music without one and then pick it back up um i just say you know get a technique that works and to me both techniques are are doable with the baton so i guess i'm i'm a baton i'm pro baton uh, i will say that you know choral conducting as a as an art tends to be more without a baton um and again that's to me more um connected to the phrasing and the phrasing and the text placement rather so much than into a, a beat pattern placement so i think choral conductors generally can go either either way and i would say that you know with conducting if you're primarily choral you have to be trained some in instrumental and if you're primarily instrumental you have to have some knowledge of of choral Okay, great. Um, another question. I was a PBS watcher as a child. I remember watching Leonard Bernstein. During an interview, the con concertmaster stated he would get mad at the conductor for rehearsing one way but performing another way. Hmm. Bernstein said, do you want an automaton or a musician? How much of your conducting is related to your musicianship? Uh, that's a good one. I'd love to know who the concertmaster was who said that since I studied with uh, one of Bernstein's con yeah, concertmasters. Uh, and it sounds a little bit like something Mr. Chapeau might have said. Um, so the question is, do you change things at the concert? Uh, often we talk about in a concert, you know, the magic of the moment. And uh, like anything, I think it has to have parameters. So sometimes um, conductors will go very out there, if you will, at a concert. And let's just say that something where the orchestra has been trained to expect something to be in one pattern and you get to the performance and the conductor makes sort of a last minute decision that, well, you know, I think I'll do it this different way. Uh, I was actually in the pit once for um, an opera and the conductor decided actually to like half tempo, or no, twi uh, the other way, half te uh, twice tempo, uh, the overture. And unfortunately the orchestra was very literal. And instead of following gestures that we had seen this way, suddenly we were seeing them sort of this way which was like twice yeah and, but the orchestra went with the gestures and tried to play the piece twice as fast um that's not a good magic of the moment situation i will say that that happened at brevard music center and and that recording went around as a party tape for years um especially when the for the the first oboist was playing and started actually laughing through her horn because it was so fast um 
So yeah, good memories, good times. Um, so, but there are some times I will say, if, if you if you trust your group, and that's the the automaton versus the musicianship. There are times when you will have rehearsed something, but at that at that point of performance, you don't change the big parameters. You don't suddenly give like a signal or a, a visual to the orchestra that is just so completely different from what you rehearsed. I mean, I do have a habit of saying to my you know orchestras, what we what what you see is what you'll get. So you don't have to worry. I'm going to suddenly change again, like a motion or a pattern or something that's really critical. But if you get to a point and the music's swelling and swelling, and at a performance, you might hold it just those few extra half seconds or a second or even longer. Um, and I think that's that's what really grabs people at the performance to the musicians. That and it doesn't have to be a lot. I think also that trust is when you can really at a at a at a concert as opposed to a rehearsal. Rehearsals, you know, we're pretty stuck in the score. But when you get to a concert and you can kind of get your eyes off and you really are just you can be very overwhelmed by the amaze the amazingness and the awesomeness of this group together coming together and uh you know creating a sound and a moment like a real musical moment um and i think that is sort of where bernstein was going with that is you you it can't be exactly the same it's got to be close enough that everybody's going to give you a little wiggle room but that comes through trust. The musicians have to trust the conductor to know when you can do it and when it's not going to work. And then the, the conductor has to trust the musicians to know that like this is the time, this is the moment literally that I can that I can shape this not a lot differently from the rehearsal, but just enough to make it like something that everybody on the, the stage and maybe they don't know it in the audience, but definitely everyone on the stage is sort of captured by that emotion and that that power just in that in that split second. Um, so Bernstein, I, I have no, I, I don't really know. You, know, I've watched some of his rehearsals because I'll tell you, if you ever like watching videos of of concerts and certain conductors, find videos of their rehearsals because that's where you really see the connection and the um like, like the, the 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 magnetism of what those conductors are saying you know sometimes you, you can watch especially if you go back historically and look at some conductors you're like wow that's pretty dry or that's pretty boring or man it's like a tyrant and then sometimes you'll watch somebody and you know, i think of somebody like dudamal you watch some of his uh, rehearsals and he's so He's so energized and so into the music, and it's like the antithesis of watching somebody like Herbert von Karajan rehearse, you know, sort of his way or the highway. Um, so if anyone who's really interested in conducting, you know, pro tip, watch fine rehearsal videos. Way more interesting to me than watching, I, I always make my students watch rehearsals, uh, rehearsal videos and come back and talk about them. You know, what did you like? What didn't you like? Um, because we learn a lot as players by watching conductors that are so-called famous and really like sort of learning what what are those what are those intangibles you know what are the intangibles that we can take away uh but you see a lot more of it in rehearsals i think than concerts concerts tend to be a little showy i think on the voting all right i think we have time for <laughs> one more question um i know okay the end so these are scary. These are good, but they're scary <laughs> questions. Yeah, very, very deep questions. All right. So our last question for today. How do you prepare for rehearsal, especially for a piece of newer or less well-known music with which you're not as familiar? That happens to me a lot. <laughs> I will say sometimes, you know, a program of all familiars that I've played 40 times is a very comforting feeling. Um, and yet, you know, everybody's got to be challenged, including the conductors. So some of my favorite programs are either learning. I, I mentioned I do a lot of uh, contemporary. I do a lot of student and faculty compositions at, at Jacksonville University. Um, 
where maybe you don't have a whole bunch of recordings to listen to. Um, how, how do I, it's like sort of approach those scores? Is that, that's sort of what you're asking. Um, first, I think it's very important, you know, if it's a living conductor, sometimes, you know, we get to talk to them. Um, if it's not a living conductor, even if it's contemporary, or sometimes I, I don't have an opportunity to speak as much to the, to the conductor, or I mean, the composer. Um, I'm always trying to sort of seek out, um, you know, the meaning um, of the piece. Uh, like, the, and by meaning, sometimes I, I mean, um, like the craft that's gone into it. Um, how, the, how the composer may have used themes, um, where I can see relationships, like uh, maybe a, a, I'll hear a, a melody and then I'll notice another melody, which is like a mirror image of that melody. I'm sort of seeing how all those things fit together. Um, I actually sort of grabbed a, a score here. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to do when we're, we're studying a score and we're, we're, we're rehearsing, uh, especially a piece that we don't know that well, um, is you have to kind of learn to zigzag your eyes, you know, because we're, we're looking at multi-dimensions when you look at a score. Um, this is actually not a terribly complicated score, but you see like the number of instruments that a conductor is going to be looking at. So you're going to see, uh, I tend to mark, um, you know, perhaps where the oboe has a solo and then it's answered by a flute, but it's supported by a horn, but then in the bottom of the page, the violins come in and answer it. So when I'm going through my scores, I'm actually going to physically mark, you know, things that I see as related. That can be in Beethoven, that can be in Brahms, that can be in Tchaikovsky, that can also be in McKinnon. That can be in anything um, that is, uh, you know, where I'm having to really, to learn it again, again in those multi-dimensions. And then you have to sort of, as I say, teach your eyes to run in like a zigzag kind of pattern, scanning up and down as, because the, the music is going, you know, literally from right to left, right, time is passing. And you can't be stuck on one instrument or one part of the score. So you train yourself to sort of go up and down, you know, across the, the page, um, usually prepared. It's not a surprise, theoretically. Um, knowing where your eyes are going to be going. Like here, I'm going to pass from the horns and out of the trumpets, down to the violas, and then up to the, you know, the timpani has to have a, a strike right on this precise moment. So I would say that. Um, I'm, I generally, especially with works that aren't as familiar, I'm still trying to look at, you know, what's the, the impact that this piece is trying to have? What's the sort of the emotional or the intellectual or, you know, those rare, wonderful combinations where the intellectual and the, the emotional really, you know, come together. Um, uh, you see that a lot if some, if a composer takes one theme and layers other themes and we really, you know, it's, it's, pretty exciting moment when you see those things. Wonderful. Marguerite, thank you so much for your time and for your um, very articulated answers. Uh, it's been wonderful. Molly, sweet, thank you for organizing. And thank you to everybody who's joined us online for our first uh, online lecture. I hope you'll come back July 12th at 3 p.m. when uh, Marguerite talks about why some pieces of music are so popular. <laughs> oh, I know you want to plug this book, right? Well, just um, for those of you who want to read more about conducting, I'm going to be super fast or Nadine will kick me off. Um, but uh, a very easy book to find oops, is uh, McCallaren's My Copies at, at Work or at my office at, at JU. Um, one thing I think that's really important for um, most of us is the idea of leadership. Conductor as leader. There we go. Um, anyone who's interested in interesting stories about conducting and conductors, The Beat Stops Here. That's a very fascinating book. And if somebody's really just dying to get into it, this is a very nice, complete um, book uh, that has a lot of online resources. So uh, there's just so much out there. But yes, in one approximately a month, we'll be talking about why some pieces are the favorites. Like what, what is it about certain pieces of music that have just made them, you know, 
become the favorites of audiences? Um, and you know, what are those, what again are those qualities about our brains and the music that brings us to certain pieces over and over again? Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. See you June, July 12th, 3 o'clock. Bye-bye. <laughs>